<laughs> okay, well, <laughs> Jean-Marc, thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate very much you being uh, with me for the second consecutive evening. Um, and uh, I cannot promise that the fare will be any lighter than it was yesterday. Uh, basically, this, uh, this lecture sort of builds on the previous lecture, which does not mean that you, have to be, that you had to be here yesterday in order to, um, uh, to uh, follow today's lecture as well. Now, uh, as you remember, I told you yesterday I had to make very quick uh, uh, footwork in terms of changing my introduction because of the uh, political pressures and events and I introduced the issue of this new legislation. Uh, so today um, I can fall back on my original um, uh, introduction which I wanted to deliver yesterday in the first place which was much, much more appropriate. So there we go. Um, last year when I received invitation, kind invitation from University of Manchester, um, uh, something came to my mind immediately, a sort of uh, a person that I associated in my mind immediately with your, uh, with your university. And uh, I make reference here to, let me open the slide, uh, to Sir Louis Bernstein name here. Um, one of your more, let's say, illustrious and eminent historians um, uh, who started working in, um, in University of Manchester, and I believe in 1931. And he continued his successful career here until his retirement in, I believe, 1953 or so. Um, and um, he is, as some of you who know, um, uh, let's say, in, uh, English hi historiography, uh, became one of the best known um, uh, historians, um, English historians, writing, uh, writing best known works such as The Structure of Politics at the Accession of George III, or England in the Age of the American Revolution, um, and so on. Now, Nemir's name came to my mind not only because he was associated with your institution, very many noble people were, but because he is, he, his, let's say, person has a direct bearing on the topic of our today's uh, meeting. And uh, his uh, uh, life choices, I would say, um, uh, had certain let's say, relevance for the issues which I intend to discuss and embark upon today. Let me start with, with the Polish-Jewish part of uh, Sir Louis Bernstein's Namir's uh, biography. Uh, well, his grandfather, one Jakub Heim Bernstein, uh, took part in January, so-called January 1863 uprising, which was one of the very many Polish failed uprisings in the 19th century against the Russian Empire, against the Russians. Now, what is so uh, spectacular and strange, it was a very rare choice for a Jew to get involved in Polish uprising. It was simply not the way, uh, it was not the uh, way to go. It was a very, I would say, rare choice. And it was a clear sign of, firm, of a firm commitment to the cause of Poland and most likely an indication of assimilation underway. So indeed, before the turn of the century, Ludwig Bernstein's parents made the final step on the road to assimilation and they converted to, Christian, to, to Catholicism, which was a definite departure. And also they changed their name from uh, Bernstein to, uh, uh, to Namierowski. And um, you can see the traces of this choice here. Now, Ludwig Bernstein did not follow his parents. Uh, he did not change his name and he did not convert to Catholicism. And uh, uh, in any case, the family of uh, Ludwig was a very wealthy family. They acquired vast tracts of land in southeastern, in southeastern Poland. Well, that was at the time Austrian uh, partition and uh, Russian partition. And Ludwig uh, Bernstein Namir was brought up as a Polish patriot. His language at home spoken was Polish. Um, uh, and uh, in 1906, he entered the uh, law school at a very prestigious law close by university in Lwów and uh, wishing to become, to become a, 
a lawyer. Now, his love for Poland and for the cause of Polish independence has been severely tested at that time. It was shaken and tested by repeated beatings of his Jewish classmates at the hands of young bandits, members of the growing nationalist uh, movement, which was already very, very racialized, if you, if you will. The moment of reckoning came, however, for Bernstein on the train from Tarnopol to Lwów. Um, imagine this scene. I mm, have it, uh, let's say, from the family of uh, Bernstein on good authority. So he travels um, on a train in a compartment, in a first-class compartment from, uh, from his friends to Lwów. On the way, the train stops at the station where the estate of his father is located. He does not leave the train because he is going further to, his, to, to do his studies in Lvov. Now, <coughs> at one point, three gentlemen, members of local uh, landed gentry, entered the same compartment. They did not know, of course, the young Ludwig Bernstein. Um, the Polish noblemen, as Ludwig soon overheard, were on their way back from the game of cards hosted by his, by his father, by Bernstein's father, well-known local philanthropist, a very wealthy individual and landowner. The three gentlemen, Polish nobles, were in a jolly mood and they commented on their host calling him, among many other things, an appite Jew boy and a Jerusalem prince. Bernstein, seated in the corner of the compartment, listened to this conversation with growing fascina sh shocked fascination. Well, if you cannot, if, you, if being a Polish patriot, a convert, changing your name, and becoming a truly Polish patriot does not make the cut what does. Uh, half a century later in London, already as a knighted uh, historian, British historian, um, um, he declared to one of his friends, I quote, I stepped on the train in Tarnopol as a Polish patriot and I left it in Lwów as a dedicated Zionist. Uh, before too long, Bernstein settled in England, changed his name to Louis Namir. Uh, in 1916, after two years in trenches, entered the British Foreign Service. His expertise in very confusing East European affairs provided him with a ticket to a brisk career in British Foreign Office. The British diplomats, befuddled by the conflicting claims, expectations and ambitions coming from places impossible to pronounce and even more difficult to understand, took young Namir's counsel to heart. And Namir's distrust of and the distaste with Polish anti-Semitism quickly translated into political advice which left the Polish delegates to the Versailles conference fuming. And the fact that Polish delegation to the peace talks was headed by one Roman Dmowski, a vicious anti-Semite, who was fond of referring to Louis Namir as, I quote, our little Galician Jew boy, end quote, did not help one iota. Indeed, the little Galician Jew boy tried to move the fabled Curzon's line westward, advocating for territorial changes which would deprive the nascent Poland of all of its coveted eastern territories, including Vilna and Lwów. Consequently, in the Polish historical literature, involved, including a book published two years ago, Sir Louis Nemir symbolizes today dark, worldwide, all-reaching and cynical Jewish conspiracy aimed at the heart of the Polish nation. And this brings us to the question of anti-Semitism, which will be one of the underlying issues of today's lecture. So with this torturous road, I introduced, uh, I introduced uh, my uh, lecture. So the Holocaust is admittedly one of the most heavily researched and uh, it would seem best known segments of uh, recent history. Some of my German colleagues, historians, bemoan, for instance, the imminent, as they say, demise or the Untergang of the perpetrator history. Due to the most profound and exhaustive research which has allegedly left few stones unturned and even fewer <laughs> issues unsolved. Many other younger scholars, discouraged by such a bleak research horizon, turn to the study of post-Holocaust memory, to the issues of commemoration and other themes which most often revolve around the question why and not giving the how a large birth. 
But with all due respect, the question how has not been resolved at all. Moreover, the recent research into mass complicity of various segments of European societies and their institutions in the Holocaust triggers, especially in the East, emotions and reactions which clearly demonstrate the extent of historical work which still needs to be done. This lecture hopefully will provide some justification of this claim. The origins of the Polish Blue Police, in German, Polnische Polizei des Generalgouvernements. Uh, in September 1939, as most of you know, after four weeks of valiant struggle, Polish state collapsed um, and the Germans immediately abolished or suspended most of the powers, administrative powers, of the former Polish state. With time, however, in the light of the worsening security situation, some institutions had to be revived by the occupant. One of them was the police. On October 30th, 1939, Friedrich Wilhelm Krüger, the higher leader of SS and police for the General Gouvernement, as occupied <coughs> Poland became to be known at the time, issued an order for all former Polish policemen to report under the threat of penalties back to work. The Polish police, known as PP, Polish Policy, has had thus been restored, um, but in a little trans uh, uh, transformed shape. The police corps has been purged of politically and racially uh, unreliable element. There was very little of a racially unreliable element, as the Jews were excluded, prevented from serving in police. Only the converts could. Um, and uh, higher officers were fired or demoted and replaced with German policemen. During the first months of occupation, the ranks of <coughs> Polish police, known soon as the Polish Blue Police, grew quickly, reaching 10,000 officers and men in the beginning of 1940. And at, at its peak in late 1943, the force counted numbered 20,000 officers. The Polish resistance, or the so-called Polish underground state, gave the Polish policemen a reluctant blessing to enter the new formation, urging them at the same time to do their best to protect the interests of the Polish nation. The Blue Police has thus become the only militarized and armed Polish formation which the Germans allowed to continue in occupied Poland. And what is interesting and what's uh, significant, this force attracted practically no historical scrutiny. What I am giving here today is a part basically of my research, which will be published as a book at the end, hopefully at the end of this year. And uh, we'll go chronologically. Initial period, the early occupation, uh, September 1939, December 1941. The anti-Jewish measures introduced by the Germans in Poland uh, struck the Jewish population early and they struck very hard. The limitation, uh, limitations placed on the liberty of movement, curfews, bans on public transportation, forced relocations, combined with forced labor, bans on employment and severe financial and property related restrictions, created hardships which very quickly undermined already in the fall of 1939 the foundations of the Jewish community. Historians have focused extensively on large ghettos, paying special attention to, majority, to Warsaw, Łódź, Kraków. Much less has been written about the smaller ghettos, such, um, uh, although that's where majority of Poland's Jews lived suffered and died. It was also in these small ghettos that the German presence was much less conspicuous. <coughs> Often the Germans were altogether absent and the role of the Polish police grew accordingly, as was the case, for instance, in Opoczno. Opoczno is a small town situated 50, 40 miles east of Radom in central Poland. In 1939, the city had a population of 7,000 half Poles half Jews, a very typical shtetl that you could find hundreds of in south, southeastern and eastern Poland. On October 8, <coughs> 1939, so just after one month of occupation, the Germans created a ghetto, the first ghetto in the nearby Piotrków Trybunalski, Petrikau in German. So the first ghetto created in occupied Europe was created just next door to Opoczno uh, in early October 1939. Opoczno was soon to follow. A ghetto has been created there in the winter of 1940. 
In practical terms, it meant that one section of the town had to be transformed into a Jewish quarter, with Jews being resettled into a small and desperately overcrowded area. This forcible relocation has been done under a tight supervision provided by the Polish police. And these are your regular constables from pre-war period. They are not trained, let's say, killers chosen for their horrible uh, morris uh, by the Germans. They are simple, um, uh, simple policemen, constables that you have seen so many times <coughs> on the street, as you can say, the cops simply. Um, and simply they have a new leadership at this point. Now, uh, this forcible relocation to the ghetto was done not only in Opochno, but in practically all um, uh, remote ghettos under the control of Polish uh, police. It was an open ghetto with a flimsy and incomplete fence being the only physical barrier separating the Jews from the Aryan side. Nevertheless, the borders of the ghetto, although invisible, were very real. A historian might wonder how, in the absence of the German police forces, was it possible to maintain the invisible wall of the ghetto? How were the ghetto rules enforced and reinforced by the occupier? What was it that prevented the Jews, at least those who could and wanted, from fleeing their prison and blending with the Poles outside? The police station register or a detailed record of daily activities of the Opochna Blue Policeman offers partial answers to these questions. I found these books in archive, in remote archive in Kielce, in southern, in central Poland, but there are many of these police reg registers in local archives, in Polish local archives. Before the end of 1940, the small section of Opochno, designated by the Germans as a ghetto, became a deadly trap and a prison for more than 4,200 Jews, locals and those resettled from the neighboring communities, concentrated in this, uh, this, this starving ghetto in Opochno. The Polish police, in addition to regulating traffic and upholding public safety, enforced the branding regulation, which starting December 1st, 1939, required the Jews to, wait, uh, to wear white uh, armbands with blue star of David. In the Opoczna police station register, we find evidence of arrests and fines imposed on the Jews found in violation of the branding regulation and for leaving the ghetto and crossing to the Aryan side. Hist for a historian, it's important to have written proofs. We have practically no other records because very few Jews from Opochna survived. It also happened that the Opochna Jews were harassed by the Polish police for wearing dirty armbands, whatever it means, I don't know. The police was also instrumental in starving the ghetto, restricting the movements of Jewish traders who tried to bring foodstuffs into the city from the villages nearby. One can assume that the Jewish peddlers and traders arrested and fined by the Polish officers were the unlucky ones who could not afford the bribes extorted as a matter of fact on daily basis by the police. In the fall of 1941, the register started to make frequent references to Polish officers' cooperation with or rather their supervision of the Jewish order police. And Jewish order police is simply Jewish police. Uh, in the case of a Pochno, tiny force six to eight people, nevertheless, subject to tight control exercised by Polish constables. Um, so it seems that Polish supervision involved on the one hand keeping the Jewish policemen in line and on the other conducting joint patrols in the Jewish quarter, in the ghetto. Joint patrols provided opportunity to perform even more house searches and inevitably led to further extortions and seizures of merchandise and goods deemed illegal by the Polish officers. The enforcement of the curfew in 1941, the Jews, for Jews it was set at 9 p.m., was also the task given to the blue police. The Polish officers were also busy escorting work columns, and you can see all of this in, in those uh, precinct registers that, that, that I that was looking at. Mm, so, they were, uh, so they were escorting uh, columns of Jews to the sites of forced labor and making certain that all the designated slave laborers reported for work. In case of truancy, it was up to them to find and to punish the offending Jews. All of these activities of the blue police, however damaging they might be to the Jews of Poland, were but an introduction to the much greater existential threats which were soon 
to follow. Second period, December 41 to summer of 1942. The opening of the next stage of blue police involvement in the German policies of extermination can be directly linked to the proclamation of so-called third regulation limiting the right, it's a long, long German expression, third regulation limiting the right of residence for Jews on the territory of General Gouvernement. Now, it uh, is issued on October 15, 1941. The most important part of this regulation imposed the death penalty on Jews apprehended outside the ghetto without authorization. Before, it was fines. Until now, the Jews caught on the Aryan side were arrested, sent to prison. Now, it was their life which was at stake. So, in November 1941, a dramatic change of German policy. It becomes much more um, radical, if you will, the, the level of terror increases. So now it was their life which was at stake. The same penalty was imposed on all those aiding and abetting the Jews on the run and an important role in the enforcement and in the execution of the new law has been given to the Polish police. If anyone had any doubts as to the true German designs, they were put to rest in the first days of November 1941, when the German order police, uh, Ordnungspolizei, uh, in Warsaw, started to transfer the Jews apprehended outside the ghetto into the custody of Polish blue police. The case files were sent to the German special court, Zondergericht, while the Jews were incarcerated in a Genscha prison. This was a special prison for Jews run by the Jews inside the Warsaw, inside the Warsaw ghetto. At the same time, the Polish police received instructions to shoot women and children trying to cross from the ghetto to the Aryan side. Similar regulation regarding Jewish men has been already issued several days before. Finally, on November 17, 1941, and on December 15, 1941, the Polish Blue Police conducted two mass executions in the yards of the Gensha prison. The photo that you, or this can of the document from Ringelblum's archive that I have here for you, is this death certificate of 18-year-old girl who was, uh, who was uh, executed by the shooting squad, execute, executing squad of the Polish Blue Police inside the ghetto on December 15, 1940 41. The shooting of the Jews on German orders became in the late fall and early winter of 1941 one of the many additional responsibilities of the Polish Blue Police. In the period immediately preceding the liquidation of the ghettos or the implementation of the final solution, the policemen in blue conducted executions of Jews in Warsaw, Ostrów Mazowiecka, Wysoki Mazowiecki, Tarnów, Sokoły, Kraków and many other locations which are simply too numerous to be listed here. The killings of innocent people were a logical progression in the ever-increasing way of, wave of terror directed at the Jews. The humble beginnings of 1940 and 1941 were a springboard with a steep learning curve to the killings of 1942. The robbery, the exploitation, the assaults, the beatings and the humiliation of the previous period paved way to the next stage and made the Polish policemen an important, often indispensable element of the German machine of extermination. Third period, Einsatzbereit the liquidation actions of 1942. On the photo you see here a group of Polish blue policemen horsing around and playfully displaying their weapons with few agents of the Polish criminal police. Um, uh, this is from 1942. In 1942, Constable Lucjan Matusiak was promoted to deputy chief of Polish blue police station in Wochów, a quaint town 50 miles northeast of Warsaw. More importantly, it was in the summer of that year that Matusiak graduated from simple cop to a murderer. Matusiak's education was linked to the liquidation of the Wachów Baczki ghetto, a relatively small ghetto with no more than 1,000 Jewish inmates. During the liquidation, the Polish policemen, Matusiak among them, operated alongside their German comrades and masters, the gendarmes. One has to say that Lucian Matusiak and his fellow officers did not become killers overnight. They observed the Germans at work and with time became skilled apprentices. A few days later, during the final liquidation of Baczki, Matusiak and other Polish officers started to kill the Jews on their own. 
These were awkward initial steps with the Polish policemen firing randomly and inaccurately and the Germans having to finish off the wounded Jews themselves. Nevertheless, the evolution from murderers' apprentices to murderers in their own right was in the case of the Polish policemen rather swift. One can even venture that the policemen proved to be very diligent pupils who in many ways, even before the end of 1942, surpassed their teachers. We will revisit platoon leader Lucian Matusiak again in a little while. While policeman Matusiak was, was honing his new skills in Wochów, his colleagues in Opoczno were loading the Jews into cattle wagons destined for Treblinka. And after the train left the station, as the Opoczno station register informs us, they went to the empty ghetto to prevent the local Aryan population from looting the abandoned Jewish property, to quote the language of the documents. While the Jews of Opoczno were on their way, on their last way, the Jews of Wengrów, town located 140 miles to northeast of Opoczno, were preparing for the celebration of Yom Kippur. They did not know that the same day the local blue police had been put on alert. Early in the morning of September 22, 1942, the cordon of German and Polish policemen and their Ukrainian helpers was rapidly closing around the city. Between 4 and 5 a.m., the ring finally closed. Wengrów was now cordoned off in such a way that policemen taking part in the Aktion action were spread apart at intervals of no more than 100 meters. On September 22nd, the sun rises at 6.15 a.m., but the sky starts to brighten around 5 a.m., so that the members of the Liquidierungskommando, or the Liquidating Commando, could see each other. The Blue Police have been directly involved in the Aktion from the first moment, entering the city with the German forces, conducting house searches and herding the Jews towards the town square, the central place of assembly. Early in the afternoon, shortly after 2 p.m., the majority of Jewish inhabitants of the ghetto have been rounded up and delivered to the market square. While the roving squads of Germans, Ukrainians and Poles searched the houses for bunkers and hideouts, some of the members of the Likidierungskommando began mass executions of the elderly in the Jewish cemetery. The mayor, Polish mayor of Wengrów noted in his very short and haunting memoir, I quote, the removal of the bodies had already started. There were carriages and people were ready. They volunteered for the job without any pressure. Our hyenas were after Jewish clothes, footwear, and the cash, which could have been found on the dead. While, end quote. While some were robbing the bodies left behind in the ghetto, others were busy at the site of the execution in the cemetery. I quote, my friends who found themselves in the cemetery had tears in their eyes when they told me about the wounded being buried alive together with the dead and with the grave diggers finishing off some of the Jews with spades and stones. Some citizens of Wengrów, working hand in hand with blue police, took off with more than clothes and shoes of the dead. I quote again. They even pulled out golden teeth with pliers. That's why people in Wengrów called them dentists. The dentists sold their merchandise through fences and go-betweens. When I mentioned to one of them, he was a court clerk, that this gold was soaked in human blood, he told me, impossible, I personally washed off this stuff end quote, wrote Mayor Okulus of, of Wengrów. The hyenas took their clues most of all from the Polish Blue Police and from the members of Polish firefighting brigades. The firefighters, led by Eichel, their chief, showed up in the liquidated ghetto, I quote, and they threw themselves on the Jews like hunting dogs on their prey. Henceforth, they, henceforth, they worked hand in hand with the Germans and, as locals and firefighters, did it much better than the Germans, noted the previously quoted Mayor Okulus. Chief Eichel carried around a briefcase with him into which his men deposited precious objects taken from the Jews. Their plan was to pull the resources and to split the loot together with the police. In the uh, Müller, the chief um, the, um, uh, of uh, Wengruf Schupo, uh, which is German city police, recognized the contribution made by the Polish police and firefighters, met with some of them in the evening at a local tavern. I quote, he pulled out from his case a wad of money and gave it to them saying, here, this is for your good work. 
Section, next section three, the painful issue of bullets. On the day of the Aktion in Wengruf, more than 1,000 Jews, so 10%, have been murdered in the streets of the city by the German-Ukrainian Likidierungskommando with the help of Polish police, the local firefighters, and with the assistance of the so-called bystanders. Another 8,000 Jews were marched to the Sokov railway station, eight miles distant, and delivered to Treblinka, nearby Treblinka extermination camp. The German-Ukrainian liquidation commando left Wengro for the very next day. Their job, however, was far from over. More than 1,000 Jews remained hidden, still hidden, inside the ghetto. Over the next days and weeks, the Polish Blue Police conducted intense searches, found most of them and either killed them themselves or delivered them to the German gendarmes for execution. While Jewish Wengrof ceased to exist, the Jews of Wojcisław, a small town halfway between Kielce and Kraków, were still hoping against hope. Their ghetto in Wojcisław, created in 1940, had a population of close to 4,000 people, very close to, to, to Opoczno, which I discussed before. Like in so many other small ghettos, there were no walls or fences to separate the Jews from the Aryan neighbors. Likewise, there were no Germans to speak of in Wojcisław, and the forces of order were represented by the local blue policemen. The Wojcisław unit reported to the county police headquarters located in nearby Jędrzejów, a very nice city. If you ever go to Poland, you can go to Jędrzejów. There is a wonderful museum of clocks. Very interesting. Um, uh, so, Wojcisław unit reported to the county police in Jędrzejów. Some reports dealt with the staffing issues, with overtime, with learning of the German language by the, by the officers, and with minor matters of discipline. Other reports dealt with ammunition. The German officers overseeing Polish police, attached to the Polish police, were, as we can see from the exchange correspondence, notoriously stingy with live ammunition. The Germans feared, for a good reason, that the Blues would either sell the bullets on black market or even use it against them, against the occupation authorities. In 1942, there was not much in terms of organized resistance against the Germans. But by 1943 and 1944, the loss or theft of bullets could bring a Polish policeman, policeman in front of the SS police court in Kraków, and consequences could be dire. It is not surprising, therefore, that before issuing uh, further supplies, the Germans expected a thorough and very detailed account of all expended ammunition. Until mid-1942, the requests for new ammunition filed with the Germans most often gave stray or rabid dogs as a reason for the shootings. In the summer of, and fall of 1942, however, the realities of Endlosung overtook and transformed the police routine, relegating the shootings of stray dogs to a distant second place. Henceforth, it was the Jews whom the blue policemen would target most frequently. And so, in November 1942, in anticipation of the upcoming liquidation of the Wojcisław ghetto, the Germans provided the Polish officers with a fresh supply of ammunition. The bullets came handy, handy because the local policemen seemed to have fired often and fired well. And I am presenting to you documents which are readily available, and I have, unfortunately, a long list of these documents, so the choice of Wojcisław is purely accidental. The blue policemen, if we are trust, to trust their reports, have fired on the, in Wojcisław on that fateful day at least 300 bullets. And all of them were involved in mass murder of the Jews of Wojcisław. On average, the Polish policemen fired at the Jews between 15 and 20 bullets each, but platoon leader Józef Machowski applied himself more than his fellow officers and during the action expended 36 bullets. The report reads, I quote, I request a replenishment of carabine ammunition for the local detachment of the Polish police. The bullets have been fired against the Jews by the officers of this police station during the most recent deportation of the Jews from Wojcisław. Names follow, end quote. 
The police reports, and three such reports have been preserved for this particular police station, testify to the fact that not only all Polish officers took part in the Einsatz, in the operation, but that Sergeant Władysław Buczek, their commander and the author of the report, requested for himself 20 additional bullets in exchange for those fired at the Jews. According to the Jewish survivors of the Aktion in Wodzisław, close to 200 Jews have been killed in the streets of the ghetto at that very moment. Keeping in mind the requests for bullets made by policemen from Wodzisław and knowing about the tight control over ammunition exercised by the German order police, we can once again take a look at platoon leader Lucian Matuszak, the previously mentioned apprentice killer of the Jews uh, from the Wachow Detachment of the Blue Police. The time, this time, however, our travel through the Holocaust will take us to June 1943, eight months after the liquidation of the last ghettos in the area and during the period of so-called hunt for the Jews, a pursuit which the Germans called das Judenjagd. Fourth period, 42-45, the hunt. In late June 1943, a constable Matushak caught himself four Jews. Two men, one woman and a child. Actually, he did not catch the Jews himself. They have been delivered to him, hands tied behind their backs with wire by the local peasants. The event was, other, uh, was rather unremarkable. After all, by mid-1943, Matushak and his fellow officers have been hunting down, robbing and murdering the Jews on regular basis for nearly a year. It can be even said that between 1942 and 1943, the officers in blue acquired extraordinary expertise in this particular area of police work. Their victims were either local Jews who went into hiding, Wachow until 1942 had a sizable Jewish population, or Jews who escaped from the death trains. The railway line, Warsaw, Tłuszcz, Małkinia, which passes through Wachow, became between July 23 1942 and late summer of 1943, the main transportation route delivering victims to the gas chambers in the not so distant Treblinka extermination camp. As we know from testimonies of rare survivors, the testimonies being corroborated by hundreds of graves lining the railway tracks, the Jews tried to flee the deportation death trains. They pried open the wooden planks of the wagons, they tore away at barbed wire which covered the small openings in the cattle, do, cattle, wa, um, uh, cattle cars and fled. Many were wounded or killed during the dangerous jump or were shot by the soldiers guarding the death transports. Some, however, managed to make it into heavily forested areas close to the railway tracks. and later looking for help, reached the local hamlets and villages. That's where some of them encountered Lucian Matuszak and his fellow officers in dark blue uniforms of the Polish police. We don't know whether the four Jews who found themselves at the mercy of the Polish constable in June of 1943 were local Jews hiding in the area or people who fled a death train. Whether they were local Jews or Jews from Warsaw is, however, of little importance. What was important was their number, number which made Constable Matuszak face some hard choices. He had to kill four Jews and he had only one or two bullets left. Wacław Homontowski, an eyewitness and one of the local bystanders, described the whole situation in following words. I quote, I have seen with my own eyes how Officer Matuszak executed four Jews using one bullet in the village of Łopianka. He stood those four Jew boys in a row, one behind another, and shot the last one in the back. There was also a young Jewish lad in Polish, Żydziak, so he killed him with a separate bullet. Once he had shot the Jews, he told me and the others to dig a grave, but told us to make it shallow, not to dig too deep. When we laid them into this ditch, one Jew who had only been wounded started begging. I quote, Mr. Officer, please have mercy, finish me off. To which Constable Matuszak responded, you are not worth a bullet, you will croak anyhow. 
Another bystander, a term which historians of the Holocaust in the East are more and more reluctant to use, at least I am more reluctant to use, described the same event in a slightly different manner in more detail. I quote, Matushak lined up the Jews one next to the other, and at the end of the row he placed this boy, who was perhaps 13, and then he shot them with one bullet. The boy was killed right away, but the older Jews were badly wounded, and one Jew boy, Zydek, begged, I quote, officer, please finish me off. But officer Matushak said that he had no bullets left, then he told us to bury them, and then he stomped on the dirt with his feet, not listening to the police, of the wounded Jew." End quote. So we buried them, but when I came back a while later, continued his deposition witness Honontowski, I could see the earth moving and I could hear the wounded Jew still moaning beneath. Homontowski did not elaborate why he had not thought at, this late, at that late stage of saving the wounded Jew buried alive under his feet. This might be the first of many troubling questions which come to mind reading the records of the court proceedings from the period immediately after the war. Did Homontowski fear the return of blue policeman Matushak? Or did he, like so many others across the occupied land, simply assume that for the Jews death, one way or the other, was inevitable? That digging the wounded man out of his grave would be simply pointless? There are several other troubling questions related to the execution in Wapianka. First, the killings of Jews in Wapianka occurred in the absence of any Germans and without any German knowledge or direct involvement. Indeed, Constable Matushak acted out of his own initiative. He solved the Jewish question as well as he could. Because there was little doubt in his mind that the Jewish question had one way or the other to be solved. Furthermore, the blue policeman was not acting alone. He could rely on at least some of the local inhabitants to assist him in his work. Third, Constable Matushak was not, from what we know, a vicious killer who had been hired by the Germans for his murderous skills to do their bidding. In fact, he was a regular small town cop with 11 years of pre-war experience in Polish police. From what we can see in his file, he was an ordinary man whom circumstances, anti-Semitism, greed, fear and opportunity transformed into a killer. And finally, we have the question of bullets. No doubt, by mid-1943, Officer Matushak was a vicious killer and a sadist. But he also had a rational explanation for his sadism, the German reluctance to share ammunition with, the, with their Polish underlings. Patriotic policeman Krulik. Grempkov is a small village, 50 miles east of Warsaw, just north of the Warsaw Shedlce Highway, a few miles past Minsk, Mazowiecki, and not far away from Dobre. The scenery is beautiful, idyllic, with rolling hills, fields, lush meadows, and charming woods. Before the war in this area, Jews made up more than a half of local townspeople, but they were also fairly numerous in smaller villages. In the spring of 1942, the 142 Jews of Grempkov have been seized by the local blue policemen, placed on carts and delivered to the nearby larger ghetto from where they were taken to the extermination camp at Treblinka. Those who stayed behind went into hiding. Unfortunately for them, Grempkov was home to a detachment of the Polish Blue Police under the able command of Sergeant Bielecki and his deputy, platoon leader Krulik. Sometime in November 1943, it is difficult to pinpoint an exact date, witnesses giving conflicting evidence, Sergeant Bielecki received a confidential report from one of his many trusted sources about Jews hiding in the area. The confidential source got it right. A short search of the house of Alexandra Janusz in village Gauki, a few miles away, revealed the presence of nine Jews hidden in a primitive hideout, sort of a crypt dug out under the dirt floor of one of the rooms. Mrs. Janusz, the badly frightened rescuer, recalled that as soon as they showed at her door, officers Ivan Ivanek and Krulik started shou shouting, hey, where are the poodles? Mrs. Janusz pretended not to know who were the wanted poodles, but the gentleman kept saying, but the policeman kept saying one to another, visibly amused, oh yes, yes, she has the poodles. The levity of both, both policemen is lost in translation. Królik in Polish means rabbit. 
the notion of a rabbit chasing the poodles might have seemed hilarious to the arresting officers. Once the jokes were over, however, Officer Krulik took a pitchfork and, visibly well informed about the location of the hideout, went looking for the trapdoor leading to the cellar. The door had been covered with manure and dirt, and under the manure-covered trapdoor were the Jews, or, as Officer Krulik jokingly referred to them, the poodles. Grohal, his colleague, descended into the hole and, not without trouble, hold all of the offending citizens of Jewish nationality, to quote the language of the documents, to the surface. The Jews and the cops, as it immediately became obvious, were no strangers. The Rubins, their children, Mrs. Gurschen, Mrs. Kaiser, all of them hailed from the nearby town of Kauschen. Officer Krulik, when he saw Jews emerging from the pit, started to laugh and said, Ho, ho, Mr. Rubin, I know you. You are from Kaushan and you made shoes for me. Don't worry, we won't hurt you. We will just lead you toward the forest and we will shoot a few times in the air and you will run for cover. I will never shoot you. End quote. After a while, four more officers entered the house of Janusz, and according to the rescuer's daughter, the still smiling officer Krulik grabbed from Rubin, the shoemaker, a wad of banknotes. Once Krulik took the mo money off his victims, he and three other policemen marched the Jews towards the forest. Soon after, the peasants of Gauki heard numerous shots coming from the distance. In a little while, the blue policemen returned to the village and Krulik asked Mrs. Janusz to bring hot water because they needed to wash blood off their hands. Once the officers washed their hands, Constable Ivanek tried to extort from Mrs. Janusz 3,000 zlotys as a fine for having sheltered the Jews. Emanuel Ringelblom, the historian of the Warsaw Ghetto, spent last months of his life hiding in the bunker in Warsaw. In the winter of 43 to 44, he wrote his last book, which was a somber analysis of Polish-Jewish relations during the war. It was a bitter text. It is a bitter text, written by a Polish Jew who saw his entire nation murdered in plain sight. Ringelblum also had a word to say about the murderers in dark blue uniforms. Referring to the blue policemen, he wrote, I quote, the blood of hundreds of thousands of Polish Jews caught and driven to the death bands will be on their hands, end quote. Referring to the blood on the hands of the Polish policemen, Ringelblum was using a figure of speech, a poetic metaphor. But then Ringelblum has not met Constable Krulik, the blue policeman from Grempkow. What initial insights can one gather from the fate of the Rubin family from Kaushin? First, the frequency or the near certitude of betrayal, which resulted in confidential information being shared with the blue police. Betrayal which, due to widespread anti-Semitism and hate of the Jews, was combined with the universal conviction about Jewish gold, just waiting to be transferred to new owners. Once again, at the risk of repeating wrong memory codes uh, so popular with Polish authorities today, one has to stress the prevailing atmosphere of fear and anti-Semitism, which proved to be devastating to Poles who dared to engage in rescue efforts and which was much more deadly for their Jewish charges. Third observation concerns the surprisingly large margin of independent action or own agency of the blue policemen in cases involving the Jews. The constables arrested, robbed and murdered their victims without any German orders and without any German knowledge. Last but not least, Polish policemen did not kill strangers. They killed their neighbors whom they had known, as was the case of Mr. Rubin the shoemaker and his family from before the war. After the war, responding to charges of murder, the blue policemen often argued that in fact killing of the Jews was a patriotic act an act which saved the Polish villagers from the wrath of the Germans, who would have learned sooner or later about the Jews in hiding and who would then have burned down the entire village and shot several Polish hostages. There was, however, more to Constable Krulik than met the eye. In his personnel file, which by chance I discovered in Berlin archive, in the largely depleted collection of SS and police courts from Kraków, we can find, that's where the photo comes from, we can find several laudatory opinions about the constable from Grempkow written by his German superiors. 
Krolik ist ein tüchtiger, energischer und tapferer Polizeibeamter. Krolik ist ein efficient, energetic and brave police officer, police officer they wrote. End quote. Not only the Germans were fond of policeman Krolik. His wartime contributions were equally praised by his superiors in the Polish resistance. Krolik, as we learn, was also a patriot and a soldier of the second department of the Home Army responsible for gathering intelligence in his area of operations. Both Krolik and his, uh, and his colleague Grochal have been described by a historian of uh, the a local historian, a historian of local resistance, I quote, as men belonging to the most valuable human element among all social strata, end quote. It is not surprising, therefore, that Krolik was widely respected by his peers and by his community. Meanwhile, in Warsaw, um, the blue police struck the Jews hard and it struck them all across the occupied land. The exploits of policemen serving in rural areas differed from the tactics employed by their colleagues serving in large cities, but at the end of the day, the Jews died either way. If one were to assume on the basis of evidence presented earlier that the Polish blue policemen in rural areas were particularly deadly, one would assume wrong. It is known that one of the duties of the blue police in Warsaw, for instance, was to guard the ghetto from outside as well as from within. After the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto, which occurred in the summer of 1942, the Polish police remained on duty to control the 50,000 Jews still alive in the remnant rump ghetto. On April 19, 1943, the uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto had started and at the same time its brutal suppression. There were 85 German soldiers and policemen either killed or wounded in this, I quote, battle with the Jews. In his report, the Jewish quarter in Warsaw exists no more. SS Brigadefuhrer Jürgen Strop wrote of his dead, I quote from the report. They gave to the Führer and to the Fatherland what they had most precious, their lives. We shall never forget them. Constable Julian Zieliński of the 14th Precinct of the Warsaw Blue Police, who, as we read, was killed in the fulfillment of his duties by the Jewish bandits, was also among the dead. Several other officers from the 1st, 7th and 8th Precincts uh, found themselves among the wounded. Let me once again quote from General Strop's report. I quote, the Polish police encouraged with additional payments strives to deliver to the nearest police station every Jew who dares to show up in the city. Conclusion. At this stage, one might want to consider the issue of the collaboration of the Polish police with the Germans. Were they, however, in fact collaborators, or did they pursue their own agenda, one which was not necessarily in line with the wishes of their German masters? From the point of view of the Jewish victims, these distinctions mattered little. Actually, they did not matter at all. For a Jew, falling into the hands of Polish police meant in practically all known cases certain death. And death followed the blue policemen everywhere. Wodzisław, Opoczno, Warszawa, Biłgoraj, Węgrów, Wachow were by no means unique. Neither were the methods used by the Polish police. The historical evidence, hard, irrefutable evidence coming from the Polish, German, Israeli archives, points to the pattern of their murderous involvement visible throughout Poland. Emanuel Ringelblom, himself a victim of Polish detectives, suggested that the Polish policemen were responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Polish Jews. We will never, of course, know the precise numbers. Some policemen were killing, others were tracking the Jews down, and still others were shutting the doors of cattle wagons headed for Treblinka, Beuzhets, or Sobibur. But Ringelblum offered us the, an order of magnitude which should be a challenge to historians. The Jewish victims of the Holocaust, in many cases, people who had a fighting chance to survive, deserve nothing less. Today in Poland, attempts are being made to portray the blue police as true Polish patriots, deeply engaged in the resistance, unsung heroes of the struggle against, uh, against the Germans, in very many cases, this is actually true. Unfortunately, as we know, patriotic engagement could go hand in hand with the involvement in the German policies of extermination. Not that this particular insight was of any value to the creators of the monument dedicated to the memory of the blue policeman from Krakow, executed by the Germans, the monument erected in 2012, 
could have been placed in several different locations, in front of Krakow police headquarters, in front of any of 125 churches which are, which, which, which are in Krakow. Not so. Without being excessively subtle, the monument now sits right in the middle of the site of the former Płaszów concentration camp, place of death of 20,000 Jews of Krakow many of whom have been arrested and delivered to Płaszów to be executed by the officers of the Polish police. Had policeman Królik, Matusiak and thousands of their fellow officers demonstrated less enthusiasm for tracking down and killing the Jews, had the firefighters from Węgrów, Stoczek and from hundreds of other locations shown more interest in putting down the fires and less in killing the Jews, had the bystanders chosen to stand by rather than to engage in the search for the desperate victims, many more Polish Jews would have survived the war. In Poland, if you will leave out the Jews who fled the Soviet Union and who never found themselves under the German rule, the percentage of survivors stands at about, as I mentioned yesterday, 1.5%. David Cesarani, in his book Final Solution, quoted one of the bystanders who claimed that for the Germans the execution of 300 Jews of Ponary meant the removal of 300 enemies of humanity. For the Lithuanian auxiliaries involved in the massacre, the same 300 Jews represented, he argued, 300 pairs of trousers and shoes. In the light of the murderous actions of the Polish Blue Police, one might want to put Cesarani's witness claim to question. Was it simple greed which provides the necessary justification and helps to explain the zeal, the application and the frequency of killing sprees committed by the local enablers of the Nazis? One can rather doubt it. After all, and despite the widespread violence, it was not all the shoes and not all trousers which became fair game. Christopher Browning, one of the most insightful historians of dictator perpetrators, argues that for the Germans the killing of the Jews was a matter of duty, following the orders and responding to group pressure of their comrades. In the case of Polish blue policemen or Polish firefighters or Lithuanian auxiliaries, I would argue, the killings of Jews drew upon deeper layers of hatred. hatred which, like weeds, sprang from the toxic soil of anti-Semitism, which grew deep over time, enriched and cultivated by centuries of teachings of the Church and decades of secular nationalistic indoctrination. Greed, opportunism and fear, or fear, were therefore powerful, but secondary motivations for the Gentile killers of their own Jewish neighbors. Thank you. <laughs>